jumping into our lives in 1989 arcade game Donkey Kong, Mario soon became the mascot of Nintendo. With a life spanning the rise of the home console, he's become not only the most popular video game character ever, but one of the single most recognisable fictional characters of the 20th century. Having appeared in over 260 video games, half a dozen TV series, a handful of anime and a much derided live action movie, Mario now gears up to star in his first 3D animated film. And to celebrate, we'll explore his entire history from creation to now, tracing his evolution over almost 35 years. In this edition of Cartoon Evolution Presents Pop Culture Evolution. Nintendo was founded in Japan in 1989, a near 100 years before the inception of Mario. Initially specialising in the production of Japanese playing cards, it wasn't until the 1960s that they began to branch out with wider entertainment mediums, such as board games, novelty toys and electronic devices. In 1974 they entered the arcade gaming market with Wild Gunman, a shooting simulator utilising a light gun to trigger 16mm video onto a projector screen. Their first video game however, arcade western shooter Sheriff debuted in 1979. In 1980 they released their first video game console, the oft forgotten handheld Game & Watch as part of a bid to rival the highly successful Atari and Magnavox. That same year, wanting to focus on international growth and distribution, Nintendo opened a US division. Nintendo of America. Also in 1980, Nintendo released their second video game, Radarscope, an arcade shooter in the vein of Taito's Space Invaders. While rivaling similar games in Japan, Radarscope crashed and burned in the West, leaving thousands of unsold consoles to gather dust in the Nintendo warehouse, and sending Nintendo of America into financial crisis. To save themselves, Nintendo of America President Minoru Arakawa requested a new game be developed in Japan to repurpose in the abandoned machines. Agreeing, company president Hiroshi Yamauchi put rookie game designer Shigeru Miyamoto to the task. At first, Miyamoto wanted to create a platform game based on the beloved Popeye cartoons, though initial attempts to gain the rights were unsuccessful. Regardless, he took Popeye's love triangle concept and created new characters. Wanting a villain that was was nothing too evil or repulsive, Bluto became a large ape named Donkey Kong, Olive Oil became a generic damsel in distress named Lady, and Popeye became a carpenter named Jumpman, described as a funny, hang loose kind of guy. Players controlled the carpenter to save the damsel from the ape by climbing platforms and ladders on a construction site, while dodging and jumping over barrels thrown at him. It's commonly considered the first video game to utilise the damsel in distress trope and to have a storyline unfold on the screen. When the game was presented to Nintendo of America, they weren't entirely sold, though desperately gave it the OK. The marketing team quickly got to westernise it for release, starting with renaming the characters. The titular character, Donkey Kong, was already an anglicised name, given Japan's aim of targeting the American market. However, Lady was renamed Pauline after the wife of Nintendo's warehouse manager, and Jumpman was renamed Mario after the eccentric landlord of their then office space, Mario Seagal. Mario's iconic bulbous nose, moustache and outfit were solidified from the start, with a red and blue colour scheme chosen due to the limitation of gaming graphics of the time. However, notably, the colour of his shirt and overalls were inversed, though his depiction here was vastly different to what we've come to know now. Definitely looking like a hang loose kinda guy here. Upon release in 1981, Donkey Kong was a smash hit. It became the 
biggest selling game of the year and the 2000 repurposed machines sold out almost instantly. By mid-1982, Nintendo had sold over 60,000 machines in the US alone and by year's end had earned over $280 million. That's almost $850 million adjusted for inflation in 2023. Not only did the game's success put Nintendo on the map and help Nintendo of America to expand enormously, but it turned its characters into overnight sensations. Donkey Kong and Nintendo became so popular that by 1983, the company was finally able to license the Popeye characters for their very own arcade game. Naturally, Nintendo instantly called for a sequel, and Miyamoto's team quickly got to work. Utilising discarded concepts from the first game as their basis, Donkey Kong Jr. swiftly opened in arcades in 1982. It saw Donkey Kong enslaved by Mario following the events of the first game, and featured Kong's son on a mission to save him. Players controlled Donkey Kong Jr. in an effort to similarly reach the top of the screen and free Donkey Kong. All the while, dodging live animals being thrown at him by the Wicked Carpenter. Similarly, Donkey Kong 2 released the same year for the Game & Watch, adapting Donkey Kong Jr's story and gameplay. These are notable for being the only two games to see Mario depicted as a villain. Also in 1982, Coleco won an intense bidding war to release an official port of Donkey Kong for their home console, the ColecoVision. Coleco launched an enormous marketing campaign to coincide with their release, including a range of action figures. This marked one of the first ever Mario toys and one of the only based on the crude Proto Mario. This same Mario appeared in a series of TV commercials for the tie-in Donkey Kong serial, marking the character's first appearance in animation. He later appeared in a 1983 commercial for the Game & Watch. Likewise, a commercial for the console release saw his first live action appearance, with actor Harris Shaw portraying him. This very bizarre and incredibly intense interpretation also appeared in a commercial for Coleco's 1983 Donkey Kong Jr. console port. Due to the unexpected popularity of the character, Nintendo spun Mario off into his very own games in 1983. First was an oft-forgotten platformer for the Game & Watch titled Mario Brothers, which saw Mario and his newly introduced brother Luigi as workers at a bottling plant, with players controlling the characters to load bottles onto a delivery truck. Much like Mario, Luigi's basic design and colour scheme were set from the start, as seen on the cover artwork. Three months later, Mario and Luigi appeared in the much more well-known arcade game Mario Brothers. Sent in a labyrinth of underground sewers, players controlled either or both characters to traverse pipes and defeat swarms of enemies for coins. As the first game to introduce this setting and the subsequent iconography, Mario and Luigi were now depicted as plumbers. Keeping the American theme, Miyamoto set the game in New York City and made the characters Italian. Italian Americans. The game was quickly ported to home consoles, with Nintendo releasing it later that year for their family computer in Japan. When the Famicom saw wide release in America in 1986, branded the Nintendo Entertainment System, the game was offered as a launch title. Prior to this, however, Atari was given American distribution for the title, releasing a port for the Atari 2600 in 1983. A commercial for this Atari release saw the first live action appearance of Luigi, seeing him in a depiction which would inform that of Mario into the future. While the Mario Brothers arcade game was a modest success in Japan, it was hugely successful in America, selling almost twice as many units. Meanwhile, the console versions fared even better, eventually selling 4 million cartridges. The game made Mario a sensation, with him rapidly appearing in various spin-off games for home consoles and making cameos in a number of generic Famicom and NES titles. Between 1980 
1983 and 1984, CBS aired Saturday Super K, a Saturday morning cartoon anthology animated by Ruby Spears. The series featured numerous 10-minute cartoons per 60-minute episode, each headlined by various arcade game heroes. One segment was headlined by Donkey Kong, and starred he, Mario and Pauline in a series of madcap capers, where, much like in the game, Mario must save Pauline from Kong's clutches. Markedly more comedic in style, the episodes usually saw the three ultimately teaming up to defeat wacky mutual enemies. In production before the release of the Mario Brothers game, the cartoons didn't feature Luigi, and Mario's Italian heritage doesn't play any part. Instead, the cartoons simply drew from the original Donkey Kong game, with a Mario much closer to his original iteration. 19 Donkey Kong cartoons were aired across 26 episodes. In 1985, platform game Super Mario Brothers released on the NES, the first in a very long line of Super Mario Brothers console games. With a desire to create a bigger hero who runs around in a setting with beautiful graphics, utilising numerous settings such as land, sea and sky, Miyamoto, alongside game designer Takashi Tezuka and their team, developed one of the earliest and most influential side-scrolling games the first time the technology was applied to an adventure game. Super Mario Bros. saw Mario on a multi-level quest to save the newly introduced Princess Toadstool, later Princess Peach, from a new big bad, Bowser King of the Coopers. Upon release, the game was hugely successful, selling millions of copies, spawning an arcade version in 1986, and rocketing Mario to superstar status. By 1994, more than 42 million copies had been sold globally, making it the best-selling video game of all time for over 20 years. It's currently still sitting on the charts at number 6. In 1986, the first ever Mario movie released, the 61-minute Japanese anime Super Mario Bros. The Great Mission to Rescue Princess Peach from Nintendo, Groupa Productions and the Shochiku Fuji Company. The movie loosely adapted the plot of the platformer, with Mario and Luigi travelling the Mushroom Kingdom to save the princess from Bowser. It was one of the first movies ever based on a video game, the other being Running Boy Star Soldier's Secret, which released theatrically in Japan on the same day. The movie featured Mario in a depiction much closer to his final iteration, however Luigi still had a little way to come with a very odd colour scheme. The Great Mission has never been released officially in any international territories, though official fan dubs exist online in various languages. It's also never had any substantial physical releases outside a Japanese VHS and Betamax release. However, a 4K fan remaster taken from an original 16mm source was released by Kaneko Video in 2022. The release of the movie also saw various Japanese merchandise, including books, records and a comic adaptation, marking Mario's very first manga. Naturally, two more Super Mario Bros. video game sequels followed soon after. Super Mario Bros. 2 was initially an advanced mode adaptation of the original game upon release in Japan, though Nintendo of America didn't think the American public would go for it. Instead, they created a new version for the Western market, released in 1988, which was essentially a remake of an earlier game, Yumi Kojo Doki Doki Panic, utilising many of its elements and characters. The original version was later released as Super Mario Bros. The Lost Levels in 1993. 1988 also saw the Japanese release of Super Mario Bros. 3, an entirely new game based on the original formula. It introduced new iconic elements such as Mario's Tanuki suit, allowing him the ability of flight. The colours of Mario's shirt and overalls were also reversed, finally settling the now iconic design. 1989 additionally saw the release of Super Mario Land, the first Mario game released for Nintendo's new handheld console, the Game Boy. The game was also notable for introducing a new damsel in distress, Princess Daisy. 
1989 saw the release of three further Mario anime, including a pair of educational shorts aimed at teaching children fire and traffic safety. While the traffic safety short has become mostly lost media, the fire safety short, Super Mario's Fire Brigade, is still easy to come by and proves the shorts to be well budgeted and competently produced. The most notable anime production of 1989, however, was the Super Mario Bros. Amada anime series original video animation, a collection of three shorts released only on VHS in Japan. Each of the three OVAs see Mario and his pals, oddly minus Luigi, in adventures based on fairy tales and Japanese folklore, including Snow White, Momotaro the Peach Boy, and Isonboshi the Inch High Samurai. Produced by Studio Junio, the OVA have good production values for a home media release and are of a higher quality than the educational shorts. Also in 1989, the Western world got the Super Mario Bros. Super Show, produced by Deke and Nintendo of America. Presented as a 30 minute block, the series featured both animated and live action segments featuring the characters. The animated segment, dubbed the Super Mario Bros., took the form of 15 minute cartoons, charting the adventures of Mario and company in the Mushroom Kingdom, and following their journeys fighting against Bowser and the Coopers. The live action segments, however, titled Mario Brothers Plumbing, took the form of five minute sitcom esque shorts, complete with laugh track, following the wacky misadventures of the Mario Brothers in their Brooklyn workshop. These eccentric and zany sequences often featured the characters alongside celebrity guests. Producer Andy Haywood said of the show, The Mario Brothers is such a unique property, we had to do it in a different way. We wanted to do a cartoon, but also do a show that extended beyond the cartoon. In both segments, former WWF wrestler Lou Albano and actor Danny Wells portrayed Mario and Luigi respectively. The series is notable for being the first time the characters were portrayed with Italian-American Brooklyn accents. Oh, I can't wait to meet all that! Spaghetti! Running for 65 episodes, the show presented 52 cartoon and live action segments, with some episodes also featuring cartoons based on Nintendo's Legend of Zelda video game. When the series re-aired in the early 90s, the original live action segments were replaced with a new one, Club Mario, starring two Mario obsessed teens, Tommy Treehugger and CoMC. This very 90s, very annoying segment was ill received and removed from subsequent repeats. Two other bizarre live action Mario adjacent TV productions also aired in 1989. The first was King Cooper's Cool Cartoons, a package series aired in Southern California and later in the UK, which saw Bowser portrayed by a guy in a costume introducing cartoons with an audience of children and leading various conceptual segments. While some clips still exist, the series is mostly considered lost media. Despite decent and ratings, it was cancelled after only one season. The second production was Ice Capades with Jason Bateman and Alyssa Milano, a two hour special hosted by the two upcoming young stars and featuring various Ice Capades performances, one of which was a Super Mario Brothers routine with dancers in large mascot costumes. Lasting only eight minutes, this Mario section is often erroneously referred to as the Mario Ice Capades special or the Mario on Ice special. In 1990, Deke and Nintendo of America produced a second animated series, The Adventures of Super Mario Bros. 3. Doing away with live action segments completely, each episode instead featured two 11 minute cartoons, which continued the adventures of the previous series while drawing loose inspiration from the Super Mario Bros. 3 video game, which had only recently launched in North America. While the series took the same artistic style and character interpretation, 
interpretations, it did see a change of cast, with the voice actors Walker Boone and Tony Rosato now voicing Mario and Luigi respectively. The series featured 26 new cartoons across 13 episodes. Between 1990 and 1991, UK based The Children's Channel aired The Super Mario Challenge, a junior game show which saw children and sometimes celebrity contestants competing against each other in various Mario video game challenges. The show was hosted by John Linehan dressed as Mario in various coloured t-shirts and basic overalls. The series was never aired in the US and has mostly become lost media, though some episodes still exist. In late 1990, Nintendo released their next console, the Super Famicom released the following year in North America as the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. The console offered more advanced graphics and sound, utilising a 16-bit CPU. Along with the console, Nintendo released the fourth instalment in the Super Mario franchise, Super Mario World. The game saw Mario and Luigi exploring Dinosaur Land, where they meet Yoshi the Dinosaur. Off on their regular journey to save Princess Peach from Bowser, the brothers and now Yoshi are set out to save Dinosaur Land and many of Yoshi's kidnapped friends. The game was insanely successful and as such, Deke and Nintendo of America produced a third animated series in 1991, aptly titled Super Mario World. Again, while tying into the game, World continued the adventures of the previous series and retained its voice cast. Much like the game, Yoshi was introduced to the roster of characters. Unlike the previous two series, each episode of World featured a single 20 minute story, offering a total of 13 new cartoons. This was Deke's final Mario production, with a planned animated movie never eventuating. 1991 also saw another animated Super Mario World tie-in, Japan's Super Mario World Mario and Yoshi Adventureland. This 28 minute interactive anime was released by Bandai for their Terabico system, which allowed viewers to interact with videos by using a telephone shaped microphone. The film took Mario, Luigi and Yoshi on a typical adventure through the Mushroom Kingdom and beyond to save Princess Peach from Bowser. To progress the story, the viewer was asked various multiple choice questions, which they'd answer via the Terabico. Again, it was produced in a fairly decent anime style. The early 90s also saw Mario's next foray into extended media. In November 1990, Koro Koro Comic debuted the very first serialised Mario manga. The first collection of stories was reissued in mid-1990 as the first Mario Tankoban, or trade paperback collection. As of 2023, there are 58 volumes of the Tankoban, which remain popular in Japan. While the manga draws inspirations from the Mario game, even adapting many of their stories, it takes on a crasser style, utilising crude humour, nudity and excessive violence. This is also despite being aimed at children. The characters also take on more outlandish, stylized designs, very much in style with typical manga characters. In recent years, the Mario manga has been translated into French and Spanish, with the only English publication being a best of volume published in 2020. Mario also made his Western Comics debut in 1990 in Valiant Comics' Nintendo Comic System magazine, an anthology series featuring mini comic stories starring Nintendo characters. The magazine also spun off into various Mario-centric titles such as Super Mario Bros. and Adventures of Super Mario Bros., which all featured stories inspired by the first three games and the cartoon taking character designs from the series. While these comics ran until 1991, 1992 saw a new 12-part anthology of Mario comics published in the Nintendo Power magazine under the title Super Mario Adventures, also collected as a graphic novel in 1994. 
Unlike the previous series, Adventures took inspiration from the Super Mario World game and featured more stylized, manga inspired character and art designs. Two one shot sequels were also printed in 1993 and 1994. Perhaps the most well known piece of extended Mario media from the 1990s, however, was live action feature film Super Mario Brothers, released in 1993 by Disney's Hollywood Pictures as the first ever live action movie video game adaptation. Believing the Mario IP to be strong enough for experimentation, Nintendo handed producer Roland Joff temporary film rights and allowed him full creative license. As such, the movie was a wholly subversive take on the Mario stories, which followed Mario and Luigi into a parallel dystopian universe hidden within the pipe maze under New York City, where they must save Princess Daisy from the clutches of the evil gangster lord King Cooper. Drawing influence from The Wizard of Oz, Mad Max, Blade Runner and Ghostbusters, the movie was a sci-fi fantasy action comedy adventure, which took the dark tone recently popularised by Tim Burton's 1989 Batman adaptation. Devised as a mythic origin story, co-director Rocky Morton called it the true story behind Nintendo's games, while screenwriter Parker Bennett noted that our take on it was that Nintendo interpreted the events from our story and came up with the video game. The movie saw Bob Hoskins and John Leguizamo as Mario and Luigi respectively, depicted here as a pair of blue collar Brooklyn plumbers, while Dennis Hopper delivered a more fantastical performance as King Cooper. The movie however couldn't balance the elements of reality and fantasy and struggled to find a distinct demographic, pushing boundaries on numerous mature gratuities while also remaining goofy and juvenile, taking in just shy of $39 million on a near $50 million budget and slammed by both critics and audiences, the movie was a gigantic critical and commercial failure. Still today, it's considered one of the worst movies of all time by some, though has grown a huge cult following of staunch defenders. If you ask me, it really isn't that bad. It's bold, it's daring, it's hugely camp, and it has a sincere heart, an innocent spirit, and a genuinely fun energy. It showed the kind of risks and creativity that would define later video game and comic book adaptations decades later. Perhaps one could call it a movie many years ahead of its time. Nintendo's prediction that Mario could survive any adaptation turned out to be severely mistaken, leading to a more protective grasp on future adaptations. In fact, in the three decades following the disastrous movie, Nintendo has only allowed a single live action film adaptation of one of their properties, 2019's Pokemon Detective Pikachu. Meanwhile, Mario did not see a single screen adaptation, period, with exception of an 18 minute educational anime, Mario Kirby Masterpiece Video, released in 1995. Released by HAL Laboratory exclusively in Japan, the film featured two stories, one featuring Mario and one featuring then new Nintendo hero Kirby, teaching the art of kanji, the traditional Japanese typography. The short however relied solely on still images with narration and kanji transcriptions. The 90s also saw a series of high profile Mario spin-off games hit the SNES, including the first instalment of the highly successful Battle Race series Super Mario Kart in 1992 and 1996's Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars. Not only the first Mario role playing game, but the first Mario game to feature an isometric 3D environment and 3D rendered characters, commonly considered the best graphics ever seen on the SNES. However, these graphics were blown completely out of the water with the release of the Nintendo 64 that same year. Named after its 64-bit CPU, the Nintendo 64 was the first fully 3D Nintendo console. Unlike previous consoles, it launched with a single launch title, the groundbreaking Super Mario 64. The first Mario game to feature fully 3D gameplay, first and third 
third person cameras and an expansive open world. For the first time, the game introduced new powers for the character, including abilities to crawl, climb, swim, kick, grab and punch. Super Mario 64 also marked the first time that voice actor Charles Martinet voiced Mario on a large scale commercial level. Martinet had begun voicing the character in 1991, providing it to Mario in real time, a travelling virtual attraction presented at video game trade shows. The attraction saw a large 3D Mario head displayed on a video screen, where attendees could communicate with him in real time. In reality, Martin A behind the scenes rigged with a microphone and a facial motion capture rig. Prior to 64, Martin A was featured as the voice on a pair of CD-ROM Mario games. However, due to the immense success of 64, it became the first exposure to the now iconic, ultra stylized, stereotypical cartoon Italian accent for many, helping to define the character into the future. Martin A continues to voice the character today and currently holds the record for most video game voiceover performances as the same character. Super Mario 64 was a commercial and critical smash and is often lauded as one of the greatest and most iconic Mario games ever, paving the way for Mario Kart 64, Nintendo's first 3D racer and the first installments in party game series Mario Party. Since the Nintendo 64, the core Super Mario platform series has continued, with 2002's Super Mario Sunshine for the GameCube, 2007's Super Super Mario Galaxy 1 and 2 for the Wii, the first Mario games to utilise motion based controls, 2013's Super Mario 3D World for the Wii U and 2017's Super Mario Odyssey for the Switch. Likewise, the Mario Kart series has expanded to 8 console instalments and Mario Party to 12. Likewise, additional spin-offs have included a line of 6 Paper Mario RPG puzzle games featuring Paper cutout versions of the Mario characters, four new Super Mario Bros. installments, a series of 3D side-scrollers inspired by the classic Mario arcade games, the Wii U edition being the first Mario game to utilise HD graphics, six Mario and Sonic Olympic Games crossovers in association with Sega, and the Mario and Rabbids crossovers in 2017 and 2022. This of course is not to mention the numerous side-character-centric spin-off series or the scores of Mario games made exclusively for handheld consoles. Mario has additionally been one of the main featured characters in Nintendo's successful crossover arcade style fighter series Super Smash Bros, which launched in 1998 on the Nintendo 64. In more recent years, Nintendo have been more open to screen adaptations of Mario, though mostly in small cameos. In Disney's 2012 animated feature Wreck-It Ralph, both Bowser and the Super Mushroom appear as characters, while Mario himself is mentioned by Fix-It Felix. Then in 2015's sci-fi adventure comedy Pixels, the original arcade Mario appears very briefly during the invasion scene. He was originally intended to appear in a post credit scene as well, hinting to a possible sequel. However, it didn't make the final cut. A final boss battle sequence however did allude to Mario's first appearance, with Adam Sandler somewhat taking the role. In 2015, Archie Comics attempted to publish a four-issue Super Mario comic miniseries, and though Nintendo of America fully embraced the project, it was ultimately vetoed by the Japanese office. Regardless, some conceptual artwork did make its way online, showing us what would have been expected from the series. The most substantial Mario adaptation of the last 30 years comes in the form of 2023's animated feature film, The Super Mario Bros. Movie. Movie, produced by Nintendo and Universal Pictures Illumination. This time round, Nintendo insisted on full cooperation, final say on creative elements and ownership of the finished film, with Miyamoto front and center of production. Nintendo and Miyamoto's close involvement ultimately made for a more faithful to source adaptation than previously done, with writers aiming to create something cinematic and emotional. Playing out like an origin story, the movie presents 
presents Mario and Luigi as two struggling plumbers who get sucked into the Mushroom Kingdom while working in the sewers in Brooklyn. To avoid crafting a film that was too straightforward, derivative or predictable, the roles of Luigi and Princess Peach were reversed, with Luigi the one in need of saving from the clutches of Bowser and Peach joining Mario on his heroic rescue mission. World design is source accurate, with the movie incorporating many visual homages to their gameplay style. Characters likewise take on their traditional 3D designs, though are given a more cartoonish edge and a broader range of expressions thanks to a Hollywood budget animation. Controversy however arose upon announcement that the movie would be using movie stars instead of voice artists, with a blockbuster hero Chris Pratt providing Mario's voice. For the movie, Pratt did not imitate Martinet's voice, instead bringing a more grounded, everyday guy sound to the character. The movie explains away the iconic over-the-top Italian voice as a character used by Mario in advertisements for the Mario Brothers plumbing business. Opening on Easter weekend, the Super Mario Brothers movie took in almost $380 million globally, breaking the opening weekend records for both video game adaptations and animated films. By its second weekend, the movie had already become the highest grossing video game adaptation of all time. Despite a tepid critical response, the movie earned near universal praise from fans and is projected to make over a billion dollars at the box office, paving the way for multiple sequels and an entire Nintendo cinematic universe at Illumination. Naturally, Mario proves to be, perhaps, more popular now than ever before. And at that, I want to know your favourite Mario game and movie or TV appearance. Also, let me know your thoughts on the Super Mario Brothers movie. As always, join the conversation down in the comments below.